chapter twenty five of geographical reader europe by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b chapter twenty five up the rhine to switzerland today we are to take a trip up the rhine it is one of the most important rivers of europe although by no means the largest the danube is more than twice as long and the volga about three times as long as the rhine and their volumes are very much greater still the rhine is more important than either of these streams for it flows through the busiest part of the continent forming a great commercial highway from the south to the north its springs are found in the glaciers and snows of the alps it rises on one side of st gotthard near the source of the rhone and not far from the tunnel where the railroad goes through to italy about a mile and a half above the level of the sea it is fed by many an ice-cold milk-white glacial stream as it dashes along down the alps into the beautiful lake constance it comes out of this placid bed only to take another tumble at schaffhausen over the greatest falls of europe and then flows on west to basel where it turns to the north and gives a safe and deep waterway to the north sea the rhine carries a large part of the commerce of this region hundreds of steamers and five or six thousand great barges are always moving up and down its waters and the traffic upon it is almost as great as upon the rivers of china there are boats carrying wine grain and merchandise of all kinds boats loaded with freight which will be transferred to the railroads to go over the alps into italy and others filled with merchandise from the mediterranean and other places beyond the mountains there are rafts of timber cut from the black forest floating down toward holland and it may be manufactured goods on their way to new york by way of the rhine and the ocean the rhine has much to do with the history of europe before railroads were constructed it was even more important than now for it then formed the easiest road from italy and the south to central and northern europe silks and other fine goods from asia were shipped across the mediterranean sea and along the adriatic sea to venice whence they were carried over the passes in the alps to the rhine and thence to different parts of northern europe and especially to the rich cities in holland and belgium about its mouths goods from the north were sent back in exchange and a steady stream of merchandise and traders passed up and down even in the times of the romans the rhine had its important cities and towns caesar led his soldiers along its banks charlemagne another great conqueror fought many battles near it and napoleon bonaparte marched his armies back and forth across it there is hardly a foot of the rhine which has not its notable history and every town and castle we pass if it could speak might tell an interesting story at present the greater part of the river belongs to germany only its beginning and ending being in other countries it forms a part of the boundary between switzerland and germany and until the germans conquered the french in eighteen seventy it was the boundary between germany and france after that conquest the germans moved their boundary line farther west so that now france has no land on the rhine the germans are proud of this fact and they always speak of the rhine as their river and often call it father rhine as we look at the map of europe however it seems to us that holland has a better right to boast of its inheritance from the rhine for that low country was largely built up by the earth washings brought down by its waters and it is still fed by them we saw one mouth of the rhine at rotterdam where it is walled in between its embankments and another where it flows into the zuider zee our journey begins at cologne on the west bank of the river this is the chief commercial city of the rhine basin and one of the most important cities of germany it is about as large as pittsburgh and has many manufacturing industries it is an old city like lubeck and hamburg it was one of the chief towns of the hanseatic league and it had at one time during the middle ages as many as eighty thousand weavers owing to the trade of the rhine and the looms its people were then so rich that their neighbors instead of saying a man was as rich as midas would say he was rich as a cloth merchant of cologne we take a view of the city from the spires of the cathedral climbing round and round up the steps inside one of the towers 
until we are at last far above the body of the great structure and on one of the highest towers of the world the top of the spires above us are five hundred and twelve feet above the ground only forty three feet lower than the top of the monument at washington from the spire we can see the rhine winding its way about the city which stretches out over the plain at the back we cast our eyes down upon the great building below us it is one of the largest and finest of the european churches it covers almost two acres of ground and has cost almost as much as our capital at washington it was begun in the middle ages but was not completed until eighteen eighty three when the great bells in the tower were rung for hours in honor of the event we look at the bells as we go down one of them is so large that it takes more than a score of men to ring it it is called the emperor's bell as we see from the german words carved on the outside which translated are as follows i am the emperor's bell the emperor's praise i tell on holy guard i stand and for this german land beseech that god may please to grant it peace and ease we leave the church to do a little shopping before we go on our steamer can you guess what we buy first think where we are and you will guess right we lay in a good stock of cologne it is in cologne that this well-known perfumery is made and we find it exceedingly cheap it is sold in many stores near the cathedral and we are told that there are at least forty different merchants each of whom claims he has the only pure article and he will sprinkle a little on your clothes or on your handkerchief to prove it we are clothed in an atmosphere of perfumes from such attempts to induce us to purchase as we leave the stores and walk down to the rhine where we stroll about the quays watching the shipping we go back and forth over the great bridge of boats which here crosses the river and watch the boys who are fishing as we wait for the leaving time of the steamer the bridge is made of anchored barges on which planks are laid it rises and falls with the water and it is so constructed that sections of it can be taken out to let the ships through soon our baggage arrives we go on the boat and see it stowed away in the cabins and then take seats on the upper deck and enjoy the busy sights all about us there the whistle is blowing the bell is rung for all who are not going to get off the gangplank is pulled away and we are steaming off up the rhine we soon leave the city and after a time can distinguish only the tall spires of its cathedral cutting the sky how fresh the air is and how beautiful the scenery the river has grown narrower and we are coming into a region of hills we wind in and out now frowned down upon by great rocks and now by low mountains which seem high because of their steepness what is that old building on top of that hill at the left it is a vast stone structure with a square tower and queer little windows some of which seem to have iron bars a part of it has fallen down and it does not look as though any one lived in it now that is a castle it was built five hundred years ago and was once the home of a baron or knight who with his soldiers lived there and made the poor people round about him give support there is a similar ruin on that rock at the left and as we go on we see scores of such castles they were the homes of the barons of the middle ages many of whom were robbers who oppressed the people and preyed upon the merchants who travelled up and down the rhine the history of this region is full of their extortions and cruelties although many of the tales told are not true almost every hill along the rhine has its wonderful story in some they say dragons lived and good and bad fairies had their homes in the drachenfelds a great rock on the rhine there was it is said a dragon who killed and ate people being i suppose especially fond of children he was finally conquered by siegfried a german hero when the dragon died his blood soaked the ground and as the region thereabout now produces excellent grapes the people call the wine region made from them dragon's blood we see vineyards everywhere as we steam on up the river both banks are lined with them every little white cottage has grapevines about it and there are many large courtyards the hills are terraced and the mountain sides are made up of green steps each step filled with grapevines tied to stakes some places are so steep that the earth is held in with stone walls and much of it was carried up from below in baskets on the backs of women and men 
we see men women and children at work among the vines they are hoeing and weeding them in the autumn the fruit will be ripe and then all will be picking grapes from daylight to dark and carrying them off to the wine presses the grapes are first tramped to a pulp with the feet and then the juice is squeezed out much of the pressing is done after dark as it is thought disgraceful to lie in bed after sunrise the peasants have a rather hard time at grape harvest still they seem to enjoy themselves we hear the boys and girls singing as they work they have parties and dances in the winter in some of the villages of these regions the girls hold spinning bees when they meet together and spin yarn in the daytime in the evening when the boys come they have a supper and dance they are good people and one of their sayings is a man who does not go to church is no better than other cattle and another is he is a bad man who can relish his sauerkraut without a sermon wages are very low in the rhine valley and the poor people live plainly many of them eat only a little gruel and dry bread for breakfast they have plenty of milk and eggs but little meat they have many potatoes making all sorts of dishes of them including soup pancakes and dumplings the steamer stops some time at koblenz near which is the great rock fortress of Aaron Breitstein, called the Gibraltar of the Rhine. The rock is four hundred feet above the level of the river, and the fortress upon it can accommodate one hundred thousand soldiers, although only five thousand are stationed in it. It is the chief of the many fortresses of the Rhine Valley, and has been used as a military stronghold for about one hundred years. We are delighted with Koblenz. It is a fine old city, dating back to the time of the Romans, situated at the joining of the river moselle with the rhine it has a bridge of boats much like that at cologne and many quaint old buildings among other curious things is the clock in the old merchant's hall which has an odd figure under it this is a man with a hideous face whose goggle eyes roll with every move of the pendulum and whose great mouth opens when the clock strikes the hour it is known as the man in the custom house and it is said that when a man from the country meets one from koblenz he does not ask him how are all the good people of koblenz but says how is the man in the custom house leaving koblenz we steam on up the rhine winding our way through the hills by many towns and villages past numerous castles until we come to a place where the river narrows and seethes and foams as it dashes by the lorelei rock the rock has a peculiar echo and there is a story that it was once the home of a wicked maiden who sat there combing her golden hair and singing she was very beautiful and her song was so sweet that the boatmen forgot to manage their boats as they listened and she lured them on and on until they were dashed to pieces against the rock the echo from the rock is so strong that it repeats many times whatever we shout at it opposite it but a little farther upstream under a great ruined castle is the town of Obervesel, whose boys are said to amuse themselves by crying out to the echo rock who is the mayor of Obervesel?" in such a way that only the last two syllables are heard and the cry comes back esel esel a word which means donkey in german whether the mayor feels insulted thereby we have not time to learn but what is the weird-looking figure that stands on the hill in the distance it is a gigantic woman whose hand seems raised as though she were commanding the world perhaps it really is a giantess and these fairy stories of the rhine are true after all now we have come closer it is a giantess indeed it is a statue as tall as a three-story house standing on a pedestal eighty feet high it was put up by the germans to commemorate their victories over the french in eighteen seventy it cost two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars and is the greatest national monument in europe that little town opposite the monument in bingen fair bingen on the rhine and that tower on the side of it on a rocky island in the river is the mouse tower where according to one story the cruel bishop hatto was eaten alive by rats you may read about it in southey's poem bishop hatto was very rich and his granaries were full of corn although the people about him were starving one day he sent out word to the peasants that if they would come into his great barn he would give them enough food for the winter 
they came in crowds men women and children thronging in with their bags until the barn was packed with them then when he saw it could hold no more bishop haddo made fast the door and while for mercy on christ they call he set fire to the barn and burnt them all in faith tis an excellent bonfire quoth he and the country is greatly obliged to me for ridding it in these times forlorn of rats that only consume the corn the poem then tells how the bishop returned home ate his supper and went to sleep when he awoke in the morning one of his servants told him that the rats had eaten all his corn and another soon came and said that an army of ten thousand rats was on its way to eat him up on account of his cruelty to the people thereupon he went to this tower on a rock in the rhine and locked himself in but the rats swam across the river and stormed the tower in at the windows and in at the doors and through the walls by thousands they poured and down through the ceiling and up through the floor from the right and the left behind and before from within and without from above and below and all at once at the bishop they go they have wetted their teeth against the stones and now they pick the bishop's bones they gnawed the flesh from every limb for they were sent to do justice on him this story is interesting but every one knows it is not true the tower was really a watch-tower erected in the middle ages and its name comes from a german word meaning to steal a little later on we reach mainz opposite the point where the main flows into the rhine here we leave the boat and take a walk through the town we visit the ruins of a roman tower supposed to have been erected more than nineteen hundred years ago we go to the house where gutenberg the first printer was born and then take the railroad for frankfurt near by here we stroll along the river main watching the great rafts of timber which are floating down to the city we walk on the zeal the chief street and look at the shops we visit the great red sandstone cathedral and then go to the stock exchange for frankfurt is one of the chief business cities of germany it was for years one of the richest cities of europe and its bankers have often loaned money to kings one of the dirtiest parts of the town is the jewish quarter where not far from the stores of old clothes merchants we are shown the house of the first of the rothschilds they have their great banking houses in london paris and vienna and control hundreds of millions of dollars we go to see the gutenberg monument in horse market square and then take a train for strasbourg visiting the cities of mannheim and heidelberg on the way mannheim is a manufacturing centre situated on the right bank of the rhine opposite the mouth of the neckar and heidelberg only a few miles off is the seat of a famous university and one of the most beautiful places in germany it lies on the neckar with a great castle on the hills just above it we visit the castle climbing about its ivy-clad ruins we go down into the dungeon where the prisoners were kept in times past and in the cellar are shown what is perhaps the biggest barrel ever made it is known as the heidelberg tun and it will hold eight hundred hogsheads or more than two hundred and eighty thousand bottles of wine it has been filled only three times in one hundred years we spend some time strolling about heidelberg how queer the students look and how many of them have scars and stripes of court plaster on their faces we are told the plaster is to cure the cuts received in the duels which they fight with one another using sharp two-edged swords and stopping only when the first blood is drawn a student is very proud of his scars and he walks like a king if he has two or three cuts covered with plaster the university is one of the oldest and largest in germany a short ride on the railroad brings us back to the rhine and we are soon at strasbourg another important centre of commerce and trade it lies two miles from the rhine with which it is connected by canals strasbourg was founded by the romans and in the middle ages was one of the most prosperous of the free german cities the french obtained possession of it in the seventeenth century but in the war of eighteen seventy the germans recaptured it and it is now one of the military centres of their empire strasbourg is especially noted for its cathedral and the great clock within it this clock is a wonder of mechanical ingenuity every fifteen minutes a figure of an angel comes out of it and strikes the quarter with a bell while every hour is struck by a skeleton 
which appears higher up beside the angel is a figure which turns the sand glass every hour and about the skeleton are four other figures representing boyhood youth manhood and old age in the gallery below these stands a figure by which you can tell the day of the week for a different one appears every day the most interesting scene however is at noon the time of our visit when figures representing the twelve apostles come out above the other figures and march around an image of the saviour while a cock on the pinnacle of a side tower flaps its wings stretches its neck and crows so loudly that the noise penetrates every portion of the great building we leave strasbourg by railroad and ride along the banks of the river to basel in switzerland where we end our rhine journey the river has still much shipping notwithstanding a vast traffic of passengers and freight is carried by rail we are greatly impressed with the importance of the rhine as a trade route and have learned that it is one of the most useful as well as the most beautiful of the commercial highways of europe end of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of geographical reader europe by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b chapter twenty six switzerland the alps put on your rough clothes this morning and leave your heavy baggage behind we are about to explore some of the mountainous parts of switzerland and much of our travel must be upon foot each must carry his own knapsack and the sensible ones will take just as little as possible a waterproof an extra suit of underclothing some handkerchiefs and woolen stockings together with the necessary articles of everyday toilet will be quite enough we shall each take an alpenstock a strong pole with a sharp steel point on its end to aid us in climbing and in walking over the ice and also smoked glasses to shield our eyes from the glare of the snow our guides will bring along ropes to tie us to them while passing over the dangerous places and ice axes to cut steps into the walls of the glaciers and up the ice banks of the mountains switzerland is the most mountainous country of europe it contains the highest ranges of the alps it has several peaks almost three miles in height and many which are clad with perpetual snow it has hundreds of great glaciers or ice streams which fill the mountain valleys and extend down into the green pastures and forests below it is not a large country altogether it has only about twice as much land as massachusetts and one-third of it is ice and bare rocks another third is covered with forest but here and there in the woods in the valleys and even high up in the mountains there are good pastures there are many small farms and rich vineyards and in all about one-ninth of the whole can be cultivated this is not a great deal but nevertheless switzerland is one of the most important countries of europe the snow-clad mountains condense into rain the moisture of the winds which roar about them and thus become the cradles of some of the greatest of the european rivers upon one slope of st gothard the rhine has its beginning in a little brook so narrow that we leap over it with our alpenstocks and a few miles to the west on the same mountain so near that we walk from one place to the other is the great glacier out of which pours the rhone to the east are the first springs of the danube which forms a vast trade route through southern europe to the black sea and down the other side of the mountains flows the ticino the chief feeder of the po the principal river of italy these streams and others from the alps water a vast territory they have much to do in making europe the richest of the continents and they are entirely dependent on the mountains we are climbing could we rise high above switzerland in a balloon and look down upon it we should see that the central alps and the jura with some highlands between them comprise the whole country we should see that the alps rise from the plateau in several ranges and that they have many cross valleys but that st gothard at the centre is the chief dividing mass with the great trench or valley of the rhine running down one side of it to the northeast and the valley of the rhone down the other to the southwest 
as our balloon sank down and hovered over the snow masses we should see that the mountains are cut up into all sorts of strange shapes there are deep gorges with rocky walls half covered with green beautiful lakes surrounded by snowy peaks which mirror themselves in the waters there are silvery cascades emerald meadows and level uplands spotted with flowers and indeed so much beautiful scenery that people come from all over the world to enjoy it and the life-giving air of the mountains so many thousand tourists come that switzerland is called the playground of europe there are hotels everywhere and even on the tops of mount rigi and several others of the highest alps we can find comfortable quarters the tourists spend so many millions of dollars in switzerland every year that the people have made good roads to all the principal places and have built many hotels they have constructed roads over the passes and long tunnels through mount st gothard and others of the alps to carry people and merchandise by railroad to and from italy their tunnels and their railroads bring the mediterranean and the north sea within several days of each other whereas before they were constructed the most of the goods were carried about through the strait of gibraltar or to marseilles and across france by rail a cog railroad like those we have at mount washington and pikes peak was built up mount rigi many years ago the travellers might see the view this was so well patronized that similar roads have since been built to the tops of other peaks so that mark twain has said there is now scarcely a great alp that has not a railroad or ladder up its back like a pair of suspenders this of course an exaggeration there are many conveniences for travellers but you cannot cross glaciers by railroad and the most interesting places must be visited on foot we take the railroad from basel over the high plains to the foot of the alps and then tramp on our way up one mountain after another through some of the grandest scenery of the world the air grows colder as we go up we leave the cultivated farms and vineyards climbing higher and higher now passing through forests of beeches chestnuts and walnuts now walking along a mountainside overlooking a beautiful valley spotted with the cottages of the farmers and now reaching the higher lands where there are only forests of fir and pine trees and pastures with cows sheep and goats feeding upon them higher still the trees disappear and shrubs and strange flowers are alone to be seen there are many bushes lovely alpine roses and creeping azaleas the grass is shorter than below but it smells so sweet that we do not wonder the cattle and sheep greedily eat it there are many small but brilliant flowers among the rocks deep blue light pink and delicate purple blossoms are everywhere growing even on the snow line which we reach at eight or nine thousand feet above the sea when we started we were in midsummer here we seem to be in midwinter say that the sun is hot at midday and we perspire as we climb there is snow all around us it banks the paths it covers the rocks and in the higher levels it is deep in the hollows we see it melting under our feet only to freeze again at night and turn the pathway to ice the air is cold when the sun sets it is damp where the wind blows over the snow we frequently see white clouds float down from above our pathway and wrap us in mist now they thicken and we are walking in a light rain now the sun sends its rays through them they disappear and we are warm again near the tops of the mountains we travel slowly the air is so thin that we sometimes gasp for breath our feet grow heavy and our hearts beat with the exertion much of the way is over dangerous paths where we move along in single file each bound in one of the loops of a long rope which is tied to the guide so that if one should slip the others would keep him from dashing to pieces over the dizzy precipices along which we are crawling in the same way we cross the ice wastes where there are cracks hundreds of feet deep and where we pull ourselves along through the snows the views are indescribable at the foot of the mountains we see silvery lakes in nests of green hills walled with these snowy peaks which mirror themselves in their waters in the gorges roofed by the blue sky rocks half moss-covered and scarred by glaciers 
rise precipitously for a thousand feet and at their feet roar and foam rivers of milk-white glacier water as cold as the icy caves in which they are born from the peaks we see snowy mountains one climbing over the other until they are lost in the blue sky of the horizon below is the jumbled mass of green forest and gray rock and beyond the snow line the glassy lakes and silvery streams reflecting the sun and the green pastures with the dots and spots upon them marking the cattle and the homes of the peasants while still far below with our glasses we can see the towns and cities of the plains among our most interesting journeys are those over the glaciers those great snow rivers of the alps which were frozen ages ago and which are freezing still there are vast masses of ice and snow filling the gorges high up in the mountains and slowly slowly moving down into the valleys writing their diaries upon the rocks and earth through which they are ploughing their way switzerland has hundreds of these mighty frozen cataracts or ice rivers the best place to see them is in the valley of chamouni high up on the side of mont blanc the summit of this mountain is just over the border in france but so much of its slope is in switzerland that many people have looked upon it as a swiss mountain it is with the exception of certain peaks of the caucasus the highest mountain in europe its snow-clad peak rising fifteen thousand seven hundred eighty one feet above the sea and high above the valley of chamouni into which sixty four of its great glaciers drain we walk across the tete noire pass to chamouni where we stay overnight at one of the hotels to get an early start for the glaciers the sun is just rising when we come to the great walls of ice beyond the terminal moraines our guides cut steps into the ice and climbing up help us along by the ropes they have fastened about their waists it is hard work our hands are sore with the pulling and cold where we have seized the ice to hold on but at last we reach the top and stand on the glacier we are now in the midst of a wide turbulent ice river the waves are piled up in all sorts of shapes and the surface looks as though the stream had been rolling and tossing like the sea in a storm when by the wand of jack frost it was changed into ice the surface of the glacier is rough with little peaks here and there it has many great cracks or crevasses some of which are several hundred feet deep we lean over one and hear the water rolling along away down there under the great mass of ice there are streams of ice water flowing into the cracks and crossing the glacier this way and that here is a pool and there is a great crevasse half filled with melted snow we get down on our knees and take a drink of ice water from the pool and then start over the glacier we drive the steel points of our alpenstocks into the snowy white surface to steady ourselves although we are tied with ropes to one another and to the guide in single file we thus make our way up the frozen river now jumping a crevasse now winding about to avoid the greater ice mounds and now skirting the banks or moraines the masses of boulders and clay which the glacier has forced up and is carrying along as it moves on its way and is this glacier moving let us stop and watch it we hear a great crack now and then and sometimes a stone rolls down from the mountains upon it but we see no signs of motion in the great icy river under our feet and still it is moving now as it has been moving for ages it is one of the oldest travelers of history it began its journey centuries ago and will probably go on for ages to come it is traveling at the rate of two feet per day or about an inch every hour be careful how you jump across that crevasse if you should slip you might be lost in the ice and by the rope to which we are tied pull us all down to destruction as was the case of eight travellers on one of these mont blanc glaciers in eighteen twenty they were walking along just as we are when they slipped and were buried two hundred feet deep in the grand crevasse the snow covered their remains and it was not until forty years later that their frozen bodies began to appear at the end of the glacier in that time they had travelled about five miles 
or six hundred and eighty feet per year borne along in the glacier after exploring the mer de glace or sea of ice and other glaciers about chamouni we climb through the snows to the top of mont blanc and later on go up the rigi and other mountains by cog railroads we travel under the st gothard pass through its famous tunnel ten miles long to the south side of the alps and after visiting the lakes of como and maggiore come back over the simplon pass in a great coach drawn by six horses three abreast we have seats on the roof so high up that we need a ladder to reach them each of the horses has a necklace of bells which jingle merrily as we gallop along the coachman blows a horn now and then and the people come out and stare at us as we dash through the villages and down the steep hills we spend one night at the hospice a large stone house on the top of the mountain where we are entertained by the monks they are kind-faced shaven-headed men in cowls and long gowns who live here high up in the alps all the year round to succor travellers who may be lost in the storm they show us the huge red and white st bernard dogs who are trained to hunt for persons who may perhaps have been lost in the snow or knocked senseless by an avalanche or by a stone falling down from the mountains every day during the winter these dogs are sent out each carrying some food and a small bottle of brandy about its neck when they find a lost traveller who is unconscious they endeavour to arouse him they sit down beside him and howl for their masters or perhaps run back to the hospice and lead them to the spot End of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven of geographical reader europe by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b chapter twenty seven the swiss people and how they are governed what a busy country switzerland is it is the playground of europe but it is the workshop of the swiss every one of the natives seems to be busy the men are doing all sorts of work and the women knit and make lace even while they are resting from their other labors all are well dressed according to their station there are no beggars and no one seems to be suffering the cities are clean and well kept the houses have gardens about them in which are beautiful roses and other flowers the stores are filled with fine goods and all the surroundings are those of thrift and good living the swiss although there are more than three millions of them in their little mountainous country have become the most prosperous people of europe they all make a good living and many grow wealthy how do they do it in all sorts of ways they are skilled in manufacturing and trading their little country is surrounded by rich nations and they have commerce with all of them exporting many millions of dollars worth of goods every year they are one of the chief of the manufacturing nations they not only work themselves but make their mountains work for them using the water power furnished by the turbulent streams to run thousands of factories and mills of all kinds about zurich on a beautiful lake cottons woolens and silks are produced at basel on the rhine ribbons as beautiful as those we saw made in france are woven by hand and at st gall trimmings embroideries and laces of all kinds are manufactured for export to europe and the united states if you want a fine music box you can buy wonderful ones at geneva and as for watches they are sold at such low prices that we are tempted to carry several home to our friends in many towns in the jura mountains and about lake geneva nearly everyone seems busy making watches and clocks some are filing out the cog wheels others adjusting the springs or polishing the cases swiss watches are sold all over the world and many are sent to our country it is really wonderful the different things they do in the villages each town has its own specialty in some places the people are all making leather goods in others they are carving things out of wood and in others turning out manufactures of metal by machinery and hand in one district on the south side of the alps the people breed silkworms and in the canton of grisson they raise snails for sale in some mountain villages the boys learn special trades and go to other parts of europe to practice them 
one town sends out skilful masons and glaziers another is noted for its fine pastry cooks another for its chimney sweeps while others supply waiters for the big hotels all over europe we see the people farming everywhere as we travel through switzerland their country is so small that they have to import much of their food but they raise all they can nearly every family owns some land and there are three hundred thousand peasant farmers we find patches of cabbages and potatoes little hay fields and pastures almost to the line of perpetual snow and every bit of the plains and valleys is given up to orchards and vineyards grain fields and hay fields and gardens raising all sorts of vegetables we are surprised at the smallness of the farms in the mountains some of the fields are no bigger than a bed quilt and others are so steep and rocky that they cannot be ploughed but are dug up with spades and hoes the grass must be cut down with sickles or scythes and carried to the barns on pitchforks or in blankets or baskets on the backs of women and men we see women and children everywhere working they tend the cows in the mountains knitting as they keep them from straying they carry loads on their backs over the roads and on some of the farms they really seem to be very beasts of burden we see them tottering along with heavy baskets on their backs held there by straps like knapsacks there is a family preparing a hillside for planting the field is so steep we use our alpenstocks to climb it and yet the women and children are walking up with heavy loads on their backs they are carrying up the manure from that stable on the other end of the road the father of the family is loading the stuff with a fork into baskets on the backs of the women and children that old woman who stands there may be the grandmother for her hair is gray and her face is covered with wrinkles she is leaning down for her basket is full now she totters up the hill and bending down pitches her load out on the ground over her head now a girl of eight and a boy of ten each carrying a similar basket have taken their places at the pile and the man is filling the baskets while a woman who may be their mother awaits her turn at the work a little farther on we see some girls picking up stones and near them two women are spading the sod just across the road a man and a woman are planting a field and still farther down an ox cart driven by a boy is climbing the hill here in the mountains are the chief pasture lands of switzerland the country is noted for its excellent butter and cheese which are shipped everywhere the grass is rich and it has such a sweet smell that the milk and butter are both fragrant and delicious we pass many dairies and we hear the tinkle 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 of the bells on the necks of the cows in many villages the pasture lands are held in common and the cows are sent out to them under the care of the village herdsman he drives them to the highlands in the spring going higher and higher as the snow melts and coming back in the autumn as the snow falls he has a house and sometimes a dairy away up in the mountains where with his assistance he makes butter and cheese sending some from time to time to the village in the farms farther down the cheese is often made in the living room of the family and the hayloft and stables are often a part of the chalet or cottage the cows living under the same roof with the people there are lumber camps and sawmills along the mountain streams and huts and cottages are to be seen everywhere in the highlands many of the houses are of only one story with low wide overhanging roofs on which flat stones have been laid to keep the fierce winds from tearing them off almost all the houses are of wood but they are comfortable and many are very picturesque they have roses and other flowers about them and are often covered with vines the swiss of the lower lands and especially of the cities dress much like the people of other parts of europe but in the mountains there are many strange costumes the women wear short skirts with their arms bare to the elbows their best gowns have velvet vests decorated with rows of big silver buttons and silver chains they have curious headdresses of cotton and lace which vary in the different parts of the country the men often wear hats with feathers in them and velveteen suits with great silver buttons the swiss are a very strong people they are so noted for their powers of endurance and bravery that in the past the other nations were glad to hire them as soldiers at lucerne there is a huge lion carved out of the side of a rock to commemorate the bravery of the swiss guard in defending the king of france 
at the time of the revolution the brave swiss died at their posts rather than admit the mob and this monument has been erected at their native place in praise of their devotion to duty in recent years the custom of hiring men out to fight has passed away for the swiss prefer to remain among their own mountains in the land they so dearly love they pride themselves on their freedom and look upon their country as the birthplace of liberty switzerland is the oldest of the republics now in existence its people governed themselves long before america was discovered and many stories are told of their independence and pride we have all heard of william tell how he refused to bow down before the cap of gessler the austrian governor and how as a punishment he was required to shoot the apple off his little son's head in the market-place of altorf near lucerne he did shoot at the apple and hit it but he had also another arrow with which he expected to shoot gessler if he had wounded his son there are people who will tell you this story is not true but the swiss who should know evidently believe it and in lucerne celebrations in honor of tell are held every year the government of the swiss republic is somewhat different from ours the little country is divided up into twenty-two cantons or districts each of which has its own local government and elect members to a national congress which sits at the capital the city of bern these little cantons correspond to our states but they are governed differently and some of them have curious ways of making their laws in certain cantons the men all meet together at a fixed time in a large field and there out on the grass they elect their officers and make the laws in the larger cantons they choose men to make their laws for them but even there important things must be voted on by the people themselves at bern we learn all about the national congress which has to do with matters which concern the whole country having much the same powers as our congress it even elects the president and vice-president and makes all treaties and provisions for the defense of the nation switzerland has fortifications at the passes over the alps and also in some other places according to law a standing army cannot be maintained within the country but every swiss serves as a soldier for a part of his life and every public school has its military drills in which the boys beginning at eight years of age are taught to bear arms so if the nation should be attacked it could put half a million men at once in the field the congress has charge of the railroads telegraphs and telephones with which the country is well supplied the swiss republic keeps up a good postal system it has such excellent schools and so many universities that its people are amongst the best educated and most intelligent of europe nearly every one speaks two or more languages for the nation has no language especially its own in most of the cantons of northern and eastern switzerland they speak german in the districts nearest france they speak french and on the southern side of the alps many speak italian there are so many american and english travelers that english is taught in the schools and we find people everywhere with whom we can talk we are delighted with the cities of switzerland there are not many of them for most of the people live in small towns and villages zurich about the size of indianapolis is the largest city then comes basel noted for its manufacturing geneva the commercial and business centre of the country and then the capital bern we spend some time in bern it is a quaint old-fashioned town lying under the shadow of the alps on both sides of the turbulent river r its streets run up hill and down and the houses of the upper level sometimes hang out over those below the most of the buildings are of gray stone with roofs of red tiles the stores front on arcades or cloisters which seem as dark as a pocket when you enter them from the dazzling sunlight outside besides the doors out in the arcades are benches or chairs on which women sit knitting while they sell toys fruit and laces we go to the federal palace to call upon the president we visit the public gardens and stop for a moment before the hideous statue of the child-eating ogre this is a figure of a giant sitting on a stone column with a bundle of babies beside him he has taken a baby out of the bundle with his right hand and is putting it into his mouth while the other little ones calmly wait their turns to be eaten the giant is horrid 
and we may see it again in our dreams imagining ourselves in his power we next visit the bear pit a well with a railing about it where some huge bears are always kept by the city in honor of its name burn which means bear for the same reason there are stone bears ornamenting many of the buildings and also the procession of little wooden bears which every hour comes out of the great clock on the tower in the centre of the city as the clock strikes a cock claps his wings and crows and then the bears come forth and bow their heads as they march about a figure of old father time who reviews them we buy some bread and apples from an old woman near the bear pit and feed the live monsters which stand on their hind legs and catch the food in their red mouths as it falls later on we buy gingerbread bears and bears of white candy with red peppermint tongues at a cook shop near by and also toy bears of brass and carved wood to take home as mementos of burn end of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of geographical reader europe by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b chapter twenty eight the upper danube from ulm to vienna the danube is next to the volga the largest river of europe it drains a basin more than six times the size of the state of new york and is also connected by canals with the basins of the rhine and the elbe it is about twice as long as the rhine and is quite as important as a commercial waterway until about the time columbus discovered america the danube was one of the two chief trade routes from asia to europe then no one thought it possible to go to india and china by sea as is now done about the cape of good hope or through the suez canal all the spices tea and dried fruits all the fine silks pearls and other beautiful things from china japan india and the various parts of asia were carried overland to the mediterranean ports here they were shipped either to venice to be taken across the alps to the rhine or to constantinople and across the black sea to the mouths of the danube and on up that stream to be transferred to the rhine in the same way woolen clothes and other goods from holland belgium france germany and england were sent up the rhine and thence down the danube to constantinople the danube was also one of the chief routes of the crusaders the knights of the middle ages who went to the holy land to redeem the tomb of our saviour from the turks in our journey we shall see the castles where some of them were imprisoned by the robber barons for ransom between the towns of linz and vienna are the remains of a dungeon in which richard the lion-hearted king of england was imprisoned for sixteen months while his bad brother john ruled one day he heard a familiar air played under his window from which he knew that his servant blondel was outside and through him was able to make his escape Today the danube is travelled more than ever although it has lost much of its commerce with asia it flows through rich countries which are now teeming with people cities and towns have grown up on its banks and vast quantities of lumber manufactured goods and food products are carried back and forth over its waters but we shall see all this much better as we steam down the river we leave Bern by train and passing through the black forest stop first at ulm a quaint little city at the head of the navigation of the danube it has crooked streets and old houses many of which were built before the new route to asia was discovered when ulm which was then easily reached from italy by several passes over the alps was twice as big as it is now we take a boat and row out into the river the water is yellow with mud and we look in vain for the beautiful blue in which the danube had been painted in song and story at ulm it is only an ordinary stream and we are much disappointed we are told however that the river grows more interesting after it flows into austria and as there are several towns in bavaria which we wish to see we postpone our water journey until later we first go to nuremberg like ulm it was a great town in the middle ages and is still one of the famous cities of europe its houses have quaint roofs with sharp gables they have many old windows 
with small panes of glass which seemed to frown down on the electric cars passing below through the crooked streets there is an old wall about the town many of the houses have antique carvings and statues of wizards and ogres upon them and they are so jumbled together that we wonder if the architects did not have the nightmare for they seem to have tangled up the town in their dreams there is one thing however that delights us in nuremberg this is the toys there is no other city in the world where so many toys are made and no other place where you can buy them so cheap there are thousands of people who work at nothing else but toys they make all sorts of playthings dolls that will talk dogs that will bark and woolen kittens that mew so naturally that all the live cats in the neighborhood stop still and listen they make toys of wood and toys of metal steam toys and electrical toys and in fact every sort of toy you can imagine they manufacture so many toys that great boxes and bales of them are shipped every year to all parts of europe and our country to be there in time for the holiday trade after visiting the factories we linger long in the toy bazaars each buying some of the little mechanical wonders to carry back to america nuremberg has been noted for centuries for its beautiful toys in the middle ages the crusaders and others here got many of the presents they carried home to their children and it was here they were made the first watches which went by the name of nuremberg eggs because these watches were shaped somewhat like an egg from nuremberg we take train for munich the capital of bavaria it has a large population and is one of the finest cities of europe it has many beautiful statues and monuments it is noted for its music it has one of the largest libraries of the world and its art galleries have so many fine pictures that hundreds of americans come here to study painting it is also a great railroad center and a grain market and it has factories of many kinds there is one thing made in munich which many of the germans might think more important than any other what do you think it is it is beer munich makes vast quantities of this liquor and exports it to all parts of the world there are beer halls and beer cellars everywhere in the german cities and many gardens where the people drink while they listen to music from munich we take train for salzburg at the foot of the alps on the border of austria the alps extend from switzerland across southern bavaria and on into austria being then known as the tyrol we ride slowly out of munich and then move rapidly over the plateau of bavaria the scenes are somewhat like those of northern germany the farmers live in villages so we see no barns nor houses standing alone in the fields there are no fences the cattle are herded or kept in stables and the cut grass is brought to them we see men women and children at work there is a field where several girls are raking hay and here an old woman is kneeling down weeding the corn while on the opposite side of the track a boy is loading up grass on a cart drawn by a dog the roads are well kept and as smooth as a floor they form long white stripes through the green fields they are lined with forest trees so that we can see them stretching away for miles over the landscape farther on we ride along great beds of peat where the people are digging out their winter fuel and laying it in the sun to dry the scenes remind us of our travels in ireland there are miles of peat beds in southern germany supplying not only the farmers but also munich with fuel for the peat is cheaper than coal and it makes a warm fire we stop at salzburg on the border of germany and austria to visit the great salt mines of hallen in the mountains nearby the deposits are of vast extent and great value they have been worked for ages and even in the times of the romans salt came from here we are permitted to go down into the mines accompanied by one of the workmen we first change our clothing each putting on an old fez cap and a suit of dirty white sailcloth such as is used by the miners we have thick leather mittens and heavy-soled shoes it all seems very odd and we laugh at one another as we stand at the entrance of the mine to have our photographs taken then accompanied by our guide we climb down one ladder after another going down 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 into the earth it is dark and the guides give us candles now we get astride of a smooth rail or board and slide down many feet farther holding to a rope at the side 
the descent is steep and it is only our thick leather gloves that keep our hands from being blistered and burned we drop rapidly and at last come to the bottom where the salt workings are we have passed many tunnels above and now see that the earth is honeycombed on all sides with passages long avenues which have been cut out of the salt rock go this way and that through the mountain there are so many of them that we keep close to our guide for we tremble to think how easy it would be to get lost and never find our way out many of the tunnels are crooked and long since abandoned some have water in them and a false step might drop us into a pool our guide leads us onward and at last we come to a great lake way down here in the heart of the mountains there are lights about the lake which aid in dispelling the gloom and we can see that the earth is not far above the water as we get into the boat we stand up and scratch off a bit of the dirt roof and touch it to our tongues it is as salt as the sea the lakes are sometimes allowed to wash down the salt their outlets being shut off so that the water goes clear to the roof great piles of salt are thrown into them and the salt is dissolved in the water this is the case with the lake on which we are riding lean over and let your hand drag at the side of the boat and then lick your fingers how salty they are the water is briny after it has become well filled with salt it will be flowed off through pipes down the mountains to great evaporating tanks where the water will be driven off by heat and the dry salt be left but here we are at the farther shore and the guide tells us to hurry he takes us to some little cars where the miners are waiting to push us out we climb in and with the men pulling and shoving are soon brought again to the dazzling light of the day a short ride on the railroad from Halen brings us to linz on the danube where it flows through the mountains from bavaria to austria here we take passage on a big river steamer and are soon on our way toward vienna the scenery is even more interesting than that of the rhine the mountains are higher the rocks are steeper and there are almost as many castles and old robber fortresses now we float by green meadows on which fat cattle are grazing now we pass quaint old villages of one-story sharp-roofed houses built close to the street in which the goats and geese are picking at the grass between the cobblestones and now along hills terraced with vineyards and mountains covered by a thick growth of small pines at some places we are close to the banks and at others so far away that we seem to be in a lake rather than a river now we are steaming by a town of thatched houses little buildings of stucco with windows the size of a handkerchief see the girls doing their washing over there on that bank they are standing up to their knees in the water and pounding the dirt out of the clothes with long wooden paddles farther downstream a woman is bathing two boys they stand up to their waists in the water while she scrubs them with soap one of the boys is crying and we judge he dislikes his daily bath as much as do some of the boys of our country see those lumber rafts we are passing the waves made by our boat roll them about in the water and the children on the roofs of the raft houses are yelling for fear what queer-looking craft the logs are tied together in piles and upon each raft is a hut where the lumbermen live while they row and float down the river we pass covered barges so odd that they make us think of noah's ark they belong to traders who are carrying their goods from one danube town to another the traders live on the boats with their families and the children play about on the floor and the roofs they wave their hands at us as we pass standing so close to the edge of the boat that we fear the little ones may fall in we wonder why their parents do not tie little barrels to their children to keep them from sinking as the chinese do with their baby boys on the houseboats of southern china now we are stopping to take on some pilgrims who wish to worship at one of the shrines farther downstream the danube has many churches some of which are so holy in the minds of the people that they think their sins will be forgiven if they can only pray in them crosses sometimes stand in the village streets and the people pray there our pilgrims are austrian peasants of all ages and sizes from little children to full-grown women and men the women and girls wear beads and some of the men carry crosses with figures of the saviour upon them and all pray and sing and cross themselves from time to time now we pass durenstein 
the great castle on the rock containing the dungeon where king richard was confined and now other ruined castles each of which could tell many sad stories of the cruelty robbery and murders of the middle ages when this was the great pathway to palestine the traffic thickens as we steam onward we pass market boats wood rafts and grain and wool barges we move on in and out among the launches tugs and steamers of all sizes until in the distance we see the tall spire of st stephen's cathedral and the high buildings of the great city of vienna End of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of geographical reader europe by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b chapter twenty nine in the capital of austria hungary before we go out to explore vienna i want to tell you something about the great country of which it is the capital austria hungary is larger than any land we have yet visited it is the largest country of europe except russia and it has more different nations in it than any other you may think its people are much like the germans so they are in the western part through which we have passed and also here in vienna but in bohemia at the north they have a different language near russia they speak the polish and on the borders of italy they speak italian austria has thousands of schools where the children are taught in the czech tongue and other thousands where they speak the slav in hungary it is even worse there are many there who speak magyar and many who talk like our gypsies other dialects are almost turkish there are so many strange languages that if we leave the main travelled roads we shall need a new guide every day we shall find the people are as odd as their speech for they are of many races joined together under one ruler there are in all more than forty millions of them and they are a very great nation indeed the austro-hungarians have one of the richest countries of europe although it is not so fully developed as those through which we have travelled the land is one of many mountains and two very large plains the mountains comprise the eastern alps or the tyrol where the scenery is much like that of switzerland and the transylvanian and carpathian mountains which are wilder as well as smaller ranges all the mountains contain minerals including coal iron gold silver quicksilver lead copper and zinc some have great beds of salt and others deposits of sulphur bismuth and alum some are also covered with dense forests in which are bears wolves deer and wild hogs at the north surrounded by hills in the upper basin of the elbe is the plateau of bohemia it is very near the thickly populated district of saxony which we visited after leaving berlin here the land is densely populated there are many factories glassworks and other industries supported by the coal and other minerals near by at the south in the basin of the danube partially walled in by the carpathian and transylvanian mountains is the vast plain of hungary which produces so much wheat rye corn and barley that it is called the granary of europe it feeds millions of sheep hogs and cattle and raises foodstuffs for export not one of the other countries we have visited raises enough food for its own people austria hungary not only supplies its own people but is able to sell meat flour and grain to switzerland italy germany france and england it is rapidly growing as a manufacturing country and although it is in the heart of southern europe with only a small strip of sea coast it has a large trade with other nations it has two thriving ports at the head of the adriatic sea in the cities of trieste and fiume and by the danube it sends grain down to the black sea and out through the bosporus to all parts of the world at vienna we learn how the empire is governed the two states of which it is composed are independent of each other in most things but they have only one ruler as to national affairs do you remember any other part of europe which is governed in this way we found the same thing in norway and sweden but the people there were of one race here as we have seen they are of many different races and hence are less closely joined austria and hungary form the austro-hungarian monarchy which is a union of the austrian empire and the hungarian kingdom 
under a ruler who has the titles of the emperor of austria and the king of hungary the ruler is required to spend part of the year in each country his home in austria is at its capital vienna and in hungary at budapest the capital of that country he has palaces in both places but exercises far more power over the austrians than over the hungarians each country has its own congress elected by the vote of its people and it therefore governs itself although for defense and for dealings with other nations it is united in a combined monarchy for instance one minister represents the two countries at washington take a look at your map and notice the extensive frontier of austria-hungary it is almost as long as the distance from california to china the monarchy is surrounded by other nations its only strip of seacoast being upon the narrow adriatic sea with italy just over the way the result is that large fortresses and a great army are required to defend it we shall meet almost as many soldiers here as in germany every man belongs to the army and must be ready to go out to fight at any time so that if war were declared four million soldiers could at once be put into the field it costs a vast amount to support such large armies and the people must therefore pay heavy taxes is it not a fine thing for us that our country is off by itself and so protected by the oceans that we can get along with few soldiers but let us start out for a ride through vienna here we are on ring street the wide avenue which surrounds the heart of the city it is a broad street about two miles in length with double rows of linden trees in the centre lined with such magnificent buildings that it has been called the finest street of the world here are the houses of parliament the university containing six thousand students the great museums and picture galleries the large hotels and so many fine stores that we seem to be driving through a long exposition the buildings are enormous some single establishments cover a whole block nearly all have five or six stories with stores on the ground floor and apartments above like the houses we saw in berlin the viennese live in flats and very few single families own a whole house how gay and lively everything is did you ever see more beautiful stores better buildings or people who seem to enjoy themselves more vienna vies with paris as the gayest city of europe its people are noted for their fondness for pleasure and their extravagant ways they are said to have more rich among them than any other city on the continent everyone lives up to his means and all seem to live for the day they are well dressed and fond of showing their clothes they are famous for their jollity and their love of music there are concert halls in every section of the city and the imperial opera house on ring street is one of the largest of the world as we stroll along through the well-dressed crowds on the streets we see many strange faces and costumes there comes a dark bearded turk with a red fez cap on his head behind him is a light-haired jew from bohemia with two blonde curls hanging down in front of his ears while farther back are bulgarian peddling canes a gypsy from the lower danube and two greeks in skirts we stop a few moments to watch the crowds as they pass seeing hungarians and bohemians italians and russians armenians and swedes as well as germans and french and others from all parts of europe vienna is at one of the great crossroads of this continent and people of all nations pass through her wide streets one human stream of many races flows up the valley of the danube coming out of the orient and another from northern and western europe is always flowing down a third stream comes from italy across the low passes of the austrian alps on its way to and from russia and germany by way of bohemia the elbe and oder and others flow down from east russia and germany it was its situation at the junction of these great streams that first started vienna even in the middle ages it was considered a good place for commerce and trade and of late years railroads have been built out from it in every direction so that it is now connected by steel tracks with all other parts of europe today fast express trains will take you from here to berlin or to rome or by the famous orient express you may almost fly to paris or constantinople vienna is also the centre of the austro-hungarian monarchy and as such is the supply point 
for a large part of the trade of its fifty millions of people but let us take a stroll out to the prater the chief pleasure grounds of this pleasure-loving city it is a great forest park embraced in the arms of the danube and reached by bridges filled with foot passengers and vehicles going over and back the prater has about four thousand acres of oaks ash chestnuts and elms the branches of which meet over its driveways and shut out the sun it has lakes and canals and velvety lawns and shady nooks with seats under the trees formerly it had many tame deer which ran about through the woods and allowed the children to pet them but here we are just inside the park how crowded it is and how all are enjoying themselves we are hustled this way and that by the good-natured people who beg our pardon in german for rubbing against us we say bitte which as they understand means it does not matter and go along with them soon we come to a part of the grounds where there are more shows for children than at coney island and atlantic city combined and we are glad of the fun after our hard study and travel we take rides upon the wooden horses lions elephants and camels of the merry-go-rounds we fly about on the roller coaster railroads we slide down chutes like lightning and see so many peep shows punch and judies and other things that we are almost distracted then there are donkeys to ride and so many goat and dog carriages to drive that we can't try them all although the fare in most cases is only five kreutzers or about two cents of our money we see many little austrians picnicking under the trees and watch boys and girls with their mothers eating at the restaurants while they listen to the music of the bands we look in at the concert hall where hundreds are dancing and take a free plunge into the city baths where more than a thousand can wash themselves at one time we then go to the haupt allee to watch the splendid carriages of the rich who drive there every evening and then walk out and take the street cars back to our hotel another day is spent in the belvedere picture gallery the great museums and the imperial library one of the largest of the world we visit the emperor's palace and linger long in the treasure vaults carefully watched by the guards for here spread out in cases before our eyes separated from us only by plates of glass are some of the most valuable diamonds pearls and other precious stones that have ever been found among them is the florentine diamond that charles the bold lost on the battlefield of granson in fourteen seventy six it was picked up by a swiss soldier who thought it a piece of glass and sold it to a merchant of Bern for two dollars and a half although it is now valued at one hundred twenty five thousand dollars near this diamond is an emerald which weighs almost three thousand carats and in the cases about us are so many necklaces crowns and other things set with diamonds that our eyes are dazzled by them and we wonder if we have not by mistake got into the cave of aladdin and look about for the lamp to rub our way out there are cups vases and basins of gold beautifully carved the crown of charlemagne the sword of harun al-rashid a persian ruler who figures in the arabian nights and also the silver cradle set with jewels in which napoleon's little son the king of rome lay when a baby the cradle weighs five hundred pounds and we wonder if the nurse did not grow tired rocking it when the little king was fretful over cutting his teeth we climb to the top of the great cathedral of st stephen's for a look over vienna the spire is four hundred and fifty feet high and we have a grand view of the city and its surroundings below us lie many of the battlefields of the past we look over the wooded hills in the distance and see the wide danube spotted with shipping flowing amongst them the forests we are told once came clear to the square in which the church stands and beside one of the buildings upon it there is a stump protected by iron bands which once marked the limit of those great woods of the past it is called the iron stick and its surface is studded with nails driven in by the locksmiths of vienna each smith had the right to put in a nail upon leaving the city after which it was supposed he would have the protection of the spirits and be lucky coming out of the cathedral we walk through the graben one of the oldest streets of vienna and its chief shopping section the stores have plate-glass windows 
in which are displayed all sorts of beautiful things made of leather ivory silver and gold there are quantities of fine china and cut glass and almost as many knick-knacks and notions as we saw on the boulevards of paris vienna is noted for its novelties it weaves silks cottons and woolens has great works in which machines of many kinds are turned out and it has factories of almost every description the people manufacture many things in their homes and we notice that the lives of the poorer classes are by no means all play the women do as much work as the men they wait upon us in the stores they are the cashiers of the restaurants and while we eat and drink our ears are delighted by bands of female musicians the austrian women do all sorts of work in the factories and in vienna itself we sometimes see them pushing loaded wheelbarrows through the streets and even carrying bricks and mortar on their shoulders up ladders to the masons on the new buildings they have long hours and receive less wages than the men among the most beautiful things in the stores of vienna are the various kinds of bohemian glassware and jewelry including opals and garnets the opals are from hungary and the garnets are so cheap that we ask where they come from and are told that they are mined in bohemia not far from prague garnets are precious stones which lie in the earth mixed with gravel in gathering them the dirt is first washed off and the stones are then sorted by running them through sieves after this they are cut much as we saw them cutting diamonds in amsterdam save that emery paste instead of diamond dust is put on the revolving grinding plates the garnets are fastened to sticks with cement and are held against the plates in such a way that many sides or facets are cut in them the most beautiful are of a bright red color although white yellow green and black garnets are found during our stay in vienna we take many excursions to the suburbs visiting among other places the emperor's summer palace at schoenbrunn where napoleon bonaparte had his headquarters when he besieged vienna and made it surrender the garden and park are both beautiful there are long avenues broken by statues and fountains and the whole looks more like fairyland than sober nature every tree has been cut and trimmed into some curious form at one place there is a wall of green fifty feet high as smooth as though it were made by a sculptor and in others are trees of all shapes End of chapter 29chapter thirty of geographical reader europe by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b chapter thirty hungary and the hungarians we take the steamer at seven o'clock in the morning and have an all-day ride down the danube to budapest the capital of hungary our ship is as comfortable as that in which we sailed up the rhine it is crowded with peasants on the two lower decks but we are above in the first class and have plenty of room we take our camp stools out under the awnings which have been stretched over the steamer and make notes of the scenery as we steam on our way the river widens as we leave vienna branching out into great arms embracing islands covered with woods we pass gardens orchards and vineyards in which men women and children are working and steam on by quaint villages where the boys stand on the banks and cry out salutations in german to us as we go by after a few hours we pass out of austria and enter hungary one of the richest countries in europe it is more than fifteen times as big as massachusetts and almost the whole of it has excellent soil the northern part where we enter the kingdom is hilly we pass through the little carpathian mountains where the danube has cut its way down to the great plains which lie just below now we are stopping at pressburg a little city with a ruined castle standing on the hill high above it this town is noted in hungarian history for generations the kings were crowned in one of its churches and its parliament sat in that castle there on the hill at one time when it was sitting maria theresa queen of hungary and a claimant of the austrian throne was attacked by several of the great nations of europe the young queen so it is said appeared before the parliament with her little baby boy in her arms she held the boy out before her and appealed to the members to aid her in maintaining his rights she was so beautiful and so brave and so eloquent 
that she carried the parliament by storm the nobles arose and cried out we will die for our queen the brave maria theresa they fought for her and it was through their help that she succeeded in holding her own from pressburg we steam rapidly southward passing many more towns and villages there are railroads all along the banks of the danube and the region seems to have a great population as we approach budapest we ride for miles through densely populated suburbs before coming to anchor at the stone quays we are surprised at budapest we knew it was the capital of hungary but it seemed so out of the way that we had not thought of it as one of the most beautiful cities of europe indeed in many respects it is finer than vienna although it is much smaller the city lies on both banks of the danube six great bridges have been built across from one side to the other and there is a suspension bridge which makes us think of our bridges at cincinnati and niagara falls we ask why a city has grown up at this point and are told that budapest lies at the northern end of the great hungarian plain where the highlands begin and that its situation on the danube makes it the best supply place and shipping place for this rich agricultural region we see many large steam flour mills on the banks of the river with hundreds of vessels and barges beside them loading and unloading flour and grain budapest is the minneapolis of europe it is one of its chief milling centers for there are vast wheat fields all around it and hungarian wheat is of such excellent quality that bakers will pay the highest price for its flour budapest is so situated that it has naturally become a great railroad centre we can get through express trains from here to paris and constantinople and there are lines connecting us with all other parts of the hungarian kingdom and with every other section of europe the city has also grown because it has been the capital of the many millions of the hungarian people and because it is the centre of their social life and manufactures commerce and trade we land in budapest on the left bank of the river the town on the right bank is called buda and that on the left pest the two now forming one city the towns were for a long time separate buda being the older indeed buda was an important place in the time of the romans and it has still the palace of the king with this exception it is of no great importance for pest has outstripped it having by far the greater part of the half million people who live in the two towns it is in pest that the chief buildings are situated and there we find all the large stores the best residences and the great government buildings we walk from the boat to our hotel the streets are wide and well kept they are paved with asphalt and now in the dusk of the early evening we see electric lights in long lines while between them electric cars are flying in both directions budapest was the first of the capitals of europe to introduce electric railroads and we can ride in electric cars under the streets in tunnels which have been made for the purpose our hotel is on franz joseph square not far from the river the long steamboat ride has made us quite hungry and we appreciate the meal which is served in hungarian fashion everything is well cooked and the food is delicious the band plays as we eat and the small fee we give at the close of the meal makes the waiters address us with respect and ensures us good service thereafter the custom of feeing is common in all the cities of europe the hotel waiters expect it but in budapest they are easily satisfied and there is no other place where one gets so much honor for so little money if you hand the man two kreutzers an amount equal to one of our cents he will address you as sir if you give him three cents he will probably call you your highness and for six cents you can be elevated to the rank of the nobility we spend some time in budapest it is a gay city with many theatres concert halls and garden cafes where the people sit out of doors and partake of refreshments while they listen to the music we go to margaret island one afternoon and eat our supper under the trees while the gypsy band plays this island is the chief pleasure ground of budapest it makes us think of the prater in vienna for there are many peep shows concerts and merry-go-rounds we enjoy ourselves in strolling along the fine drives and watching the children play on the grass it is funny to see the babies carried around by their nursemaids on pillows 
each little one is pinned down under a white muslin cloth so that it cannot raise its arms or even kick very high the babies wink and blink as we look at them and sometimes one cries out in fright at the strange americans returning to the city we take a drive through the wide andrassy road a boulevard more than two miles in length lined with magnificent palaces and villas surrounded by gardens we visit the parliament houses the markets and the great picture galleries budapest has public libraries a university containing more than four thousand students and all sorts of schools including kindergartens for children of from three to six years the schools of budapest are conducted in the magyar language but in many parts of hungary other languages are used there are seventeen different peoples living in hungary each of which has its own dialect so that it is difficult for even a hungarian to make himself understood in all parts of his country there are magyars slovaks rumanians bulgarians servians germans jews gypsies and many others the magyars are the ruling race and they own the richest parts of the country they originally came from asia but centuries ago made their way up the danube and settled in hungary they are a very brave people patriotic and strong proud and hospitable they are fond of titles and children are taught to show great respect to their elders as well as to one another on ceremonial occasions a child addresses his father as mr father and its mother as mrs mother the oldest brother is then called mr elder brother and the oldest sister miss elder sister while the younger members of the family may be miss younger sister and mr younger brother the better classes of the magyars are well educated the rich dress in costly clothing the court costume of the men being a satin jacket embroidered with gold tight-fitting breeches and top boots with spurs to which are added a belt of gold and a fur cap sometimes ornamented with precious stones the dress of the peasants of hungary varies with the locality we see strangely clad people in the markets of budapest and we shall meet others at almost every port as we go on down the danube it seems queer to see women wearing top boots but we grow accustomed to this long before we leave hungary the women of many sections have on boots of green red and other bright colored leathers which reach almost to their knees they wear short skirts and often have tight-fitting waists of different colors and aprons which are beautifully embroidered they seldom wear bonnets and frequently have nothing at all on their heads in some places their hair is braided into one long plait interwoven with ribbons which are tied in a bow at the end the dress of the peasant men is as odd as that of the women one costume consists of a jacket with silver or nickel buttons a bright red waistcoat with white linen sleeves of great width and wide fringed drawers which are embroidered with red and green and tucked into high top boots in the winter many of the peasants wear sheepskin coats with the wool inside and in the summer they sometimes have similar coats with the wool showing in the carpathian mountains are the slovaks whose dress is somewhat like the magyars but not so neat they wear the top boots and wide short trousers but instead of a waistcoat they have a broad yellow belt a yard wide covered with buttons coins and other ornaments these people have large hats and woolen coats of white embroidered in red and green the women plait ribbons in their hair and then tie it up around their heads the gypsies have their peculiar costume and so have the people of nearly every other hungarian tribe End of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of geographical reader europe by frank g carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b chapter thirty one on the lower danube from budapest to the black sea along the lower danube are some of the most interesting parts of europe the river flows across the great plain of hungary and between the transylvanian alps and the balkan mountains through lands inhabited by strange peoples many of which are little civilized and some almost unknown the great river has several large tributaries in hungary we pass the mouth of the drava on the right and that of the tice on the left before reaching the servian boundary both rivers are filled with shipping 
the thais has hundreds of steamers and a stream of grain barges and lumber rafts is always flowing through the francis canal which has been cut from that river across to the danube we are intensely interested in the strange sights of the hungarian plain the country reminds us of the mississippi valley now the land is rolling like the prairies of illinois and iowa and now it is as flat as nebraska and kansas we see vast crops of wheat corn rye oats and barley but there are no fences barns or farmhouses standing alone on the landscape as in the grain growing parts of the united states now we are passing through a region where there is nothing but wheat 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 it is spread out about us in a great golden ocean which rises and falls in billows as the wind sweeps over it we see more and more grain as we go on with our journey we are traveling through some of the chief breadlands of europe lands which for centuries have produced the finest of wheat and which are still yielding some of the richest crops of the world we saw something of the product in the great flour mills of budapest we see more of it in the scores of huge barges loaded with grain which are steaming slowly on up the river many of them carry as much as five hundred tons of wheat they have double rudders and high carved red and blue prows some are roofed over so that they look like floating houses each barge has a family or two living in it and the children sit on the roofs and stare at us as we go by see that barge we are now passing it is poled and rowed along by men and behind come three others towed by a steam tug some of the barges have their own engines to move them there are also other steam vessels laden with wheat and in fact a steady line of grain ships is always moving to and fro on the danube there on the right are barges at anchor i mean those two not far from the shore with the great wheel between them see the wheel is rapidly turning moved around by the swift flowing current that is one of the famous floating flour mills of the danube they are anchored in it here and there throughout the wheat belt the large barge contains the grinding machinery which is moved by the paddle wheel you can see the white-faced miller in his dusty clothes standing there at its stern the small barge is merely a support for the other end of the wheel now look beyond the mill to the banks see the ox carts which are coming up loaded with wheat there on the edge of the water men are throwing the bags into a boat they will soon row them out to the mill and when the grain has been ground will take back the flour by and by the mill may be floated down the river to some other wheat region and there go on with its grinding see that town farther on where the farmers are threshing it has stacks of straw about its flat hard earthen threshing floor the men are pounding the grain out with flails at one side they are driving some cattle about over the wheat that their beasts may tread out the grain such threshing places are common along the banks of the danube the people bring their crops to one place and thresh out the grain bagging it up and shipping it on the barges and steamers which stop there for cargo we see similar work going on as we float down past servia bulgaria and roumania save that the farming is much ruder in servia than in hungary there are very few reaping and mowing machines anywhere the grain is cut with scythes a score or more of men moving along in a row through the fields while as many women follow behind binding the sheaves almost as important as the grain are the immense herds of horses pigs cattle and sheep which are found everywhere along the lower danube from budapest to the sea see that immense flock of sheep over there on the left bank the man standing among them leaning on his crook is the shepherd he is dressed in sheepskin clothing and wears a pair of high boots farther on is a drove of hogs watched by a swineherd and on the opposite bank are cattle and horses under the care of hungarian cowboys those little straw huts are where they take shelter in stormy weather the cowboys of the danube are quite as lively as those of our western plains they are high-spirited fellows and when they come into town for a holiday they discard their sheepskin jackets and wear the gayest of clothing they have silk sashes about their waists and overcoats embroidered with flowers while their hats are often decorated with ribbons they are proud of their horses and on such occasions ornament them with tinkling bells and strips of bright silk 
the towns of the lower danube are as queer as the country the farmers live in villages and go out to work in the fields the usual village is composed of one long street in which there are benches under the trees where the people sit in the evening and gossip the women knit as they talk and they knit even when they rest at their work in the fields many of the houses are painted white with blue doors their roofs are of red tiles or straw thatch each house has a fence about it and at the back there are stables with ricks of grain near them on some of the homes the storks have built their nests and we now and then see storks feeding in the mud along the banks of the river we float past the mouth of the tice river and stay overnight at belgrade the capital of servia at the mouth of the Save. the danube forms a part of the boundary between servia and hungary and for the next day we shall travel along between the two countries belgrade is situated on a high point at the junction of the Save and the danube it is a flat town of yellowish white houses which look bare and lonely on the hills above the river we take a walk through the streets before going to bed and meet many men in fez caps short jackets and white skirts which reach to their knees not a few carry knives and pistols in their belts and we wonder if it would not be dangerous for us to go about alone after dark there are also people dressed as we are and turks wearing turbans or caps of red fez and full baggy trousers not only servia but also roumania and bulgaria and other countries of this part of europe have until recently belonged to the turkish empire and we shall see more and more turks as we travel on southward belgrade has mohammedan mosques and so have most of the other towns and cities of the balkan peninsula but who are these fine-looking queerly dressed men coming toward us they have dark faces long hair and long bushy beards they wear tall black caps and black robes with wide sashes of blue those are priests of the greek orthodox church the religion most common in this part of the world it is the principal religion of servia bulgaria and roumania and also of russia and greece we shall see many many priests as we go on with our travels servia and roumania are now independent countries each has its own king and a parliament elected by the people and each is rapidly growing in intelligence and prosperity bulgaria is also practically free for it elects its own prince and parliament although the sultan of turkey must confirm the election of the prince servia is a little larger than our two states of vermont and new hampshire roumania is larger than new york and bulgaria is just about the size of west virginia the chief business of all these countries is agriculture and stock raising although there is some manufacturing which will probably be increased in the future as there are coal iron and other minerals in the mountains we are on the edge of the mountains at belgrade and we float in and out through the hills as we go on with our journey the danube narrows and widens there are many rapids and now and then we pass through great canyons we seem slowly through the gorge of kazan where the cliffs rise above us for hundreds of feet and where it looks as though the rocks were torn apart to let the great river through we say good-bye to hungary at the lively town of orsova the last steamer station of that country on the danube and then go on through the famed iron gate to the smoother waters below the iron gate is one of the most dangerous places in the course of this mighty river it is a ledge of gigantic tooth-shaped rocks about a mile wide which almost fills the danube the tops of the rocks rise high above the surface when the water is low and the water seethes and foams as it dashes over them hundreds of steamers have been wrecked on the iron gate and for ages it has been a great obstruction to navigation within the past few years a canal has been cut through it and now ordinary ships can easily pass our journey for a short time after leaving the iron gate is between roumania and servia and farther on through roumania and bulgaria between which countries the danube flows on and on until it branches out into several mouths and empties into the black sea on the edge of the great russian empire there are more signs of thrift in bulgaria and roumania than in servia the countries are richer roumania having some of the richest wheat fields of the european continent while bulgaria exports a vast deal of indian corn 
the people here wear better clothes than in servia and they seem to be more prosperous and more enterprising both the roumanians and the bulgarians are noted for their intelligence and thrift and the roumanians especially are a fine-looking race the women being famous for their beauty at the roumanian ports gypsy bands come to the boats and play for us roumania is the home of the gypsies although they form but a small part of the population they have always been a wandering people living in covered wagons and moving about over the country they have curious customs and many a band has its gypsy queen some of the gypsies tell fortunes they also do manufacturing in a small way and many are tinkers blacksmiths and horse traders in the past they have been despised and ill-treated but they now are better off in this part of the world on account of the love of the people for music the roumanian gypsies are natural musicians even the smaller of the gypsy children play the violin and the gypsy bands are in demand almost everywhere many of the gypsies leave the valley of the danube and we find them in all parts of europe and even in the united states we end our journey on the danube at rustchuk from where we make a side trip to the fine large city of bucharest the capital of roumania and then take train for varna on the black sea where we get a ship for odessa in russia End of chapter 31